How many of you like stories? I love stories. I grew up reading all kinds of stories. And our Bible is full of stories. It's one of the best ways that we communicate. And when we get together, that's often what we do. Hey, did I tell you what happened yesterday? And then we tell our story. Well, today we are going to look at probably one of the most well-known stories in the Bible because it's Christmas time. And we love to tell the story of who Jesus is and how he came to earth and the real reason behind why we celebrate Christmas. But so many times when we're watching stories that are made into say a movie format, or maybe you walk into a room and somebody has been telling someone else a story and you're halfway in and you don't know what the context is, you're like, oh, wait, what, what's that about? What are you telling me? I don't understand, who's that character? And how come you just said this? And you, you listen and you wait and you try to figure out what it is based on what they're saying. But usually if it's a movie or a TV show, it's easier somebody just goes, hey, let me hit pause. I'm gonna give you a little background and then we'll keep watching it. And if you want, you can go back and read the rest of it later. So many times when we pick up our Bibles, we, are diving into the middle of the story and we don't have that context. So tonight, today, I want to go back to just a little bit further than maybe we normally look when we talk about the story of Jesus coming to earth as a baby. And I'm going to start in an Old Testament book with this crazy prophet who was paid by enemies of Israel to bring down curses on them. And you may say, what does that have to do with the story of Jesus? Well, let me read you what he says. Instead of bringing a curse down, he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And what he did thousands of years ago is he promised the people of Israel and everybody in that region that one day out of the nation of Israel would come a king a star out of Israel. And that matters because of what we'll talk about in the story of Jesus. And then later, a prophet of God who served God well made this statement. He said, herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. So somebody's going to come bearing gold and incense. And that matters because it's a promise that is made by Isaiah about something that will happen in the future. And much of Isaiah talks about the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. And then right after Isaiah in our Bibles, a little bit later in the time sequence of, of the delivering of the message of God is this book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is full of this statement. This is what the Lord says. It's a direct revelation from God. And this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And you may say, what in the world does that have to do with the Christmas story? You're going to find out. Another one is this prophet Micah. And he delivers a promise about a specific location. He says, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And so a promise is made that a king will be the one who rules. And then, in probably one of the more bizarre places that we see in the Old Testament, this prophet who is told specifically by God to go marry a prostitute and have children with her, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, this statement is made. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. These are all these little pieces of the puzzle, and right now it's very much that. It's a puzzle, and you may say, what in the world does any of them have to do with the story of Jesus? We're going to get there, and it's in Matthew chapter 2. So you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2, and I'm going to read you a good bit of it. Matthew 2 verse 1 says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all, is, all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. 
In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd. He will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are gold and incenses. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled when the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So many times we hear the story of Jesus' birth, and it's a happy time. We have the picture of the nativity scene. We put all of the characters that are found throughout the Gospels all at the same time, at the same place. And that's not how it played out when you actually read what happened. This particular setting is after Jesus has been born, and he's been there for a little while. And the reason we know that is when Herod sought to find out his age, he was possibly up to two years old. And that's one of the reasons why Herod did what he did, the horrific acts that he engaged in. So Jesus has been born, and he's staying with his mother, as all babies do, and she's taking care of him. And out in the east somewhere, these men, who the NIV calls magi, have seen a star, and they're familiar with what are called the Hebrew scriptures. They have read the prophecies, and these magi, the word that should sound familiar from that would be the word magician. We might even think of them as wizards. And you may say, wizards in the Bible? That's what a magician who's a man typically is called. And these are Gentiles. These are not people who have grown up believing in the one true God, but they are searching for this promised king. So what do they do? They get together some gifts. They're wealthy because they can travel a great distance and not fear for their lives. And they gather together and they travel and they begin looking for where is this star taking us? And they figure out that it's in Jerusalem. So they come into Jerusalem and they look for the king because it makes sense that if a king is going to be born that it would be born in the house of a king. So they find Herod and they say, hey, uh, we have heard, read, that there's going to be a king born here and we would like to go and worship him. And Herod, who we'll talk about just how interesting a king he was in a second, gathers together all of the people who should know about this. That would be the chief priests, the leading priests, and all of the scribes. And he says to them, so hey, uh, these guys are here looking for where the king might be born. Do you all know about that? And they, in good, really smart people form, oh yeah, yeah, we know. It's in Bethlehem of Judea. And it's kind of like, that was easy. You got anything else? And so Herod, now that he's gotten the answer he wants, without anybody else being aware, has the wise men come and talk to him quietly, secretly, separately. And he says, hey guys, the king you seek is in Bethlehem. That's uh, south of here. And if you travel and find him, hey, do me a favor. Let me know, and I would like to come and worship him too. So the wise men leave. They make their way to Bethlehem. 
And then according to the text, we, we find out that this star guides them. Now, we don't know what this star is exactly, but this star guides them and takes them to the house where Jesus is staying. And they go inside, and when they see him, they fall down and they worship him. And then they present him with gifts. And the gifts they present him with are worthy of a king. As a matter of fact, most historians say that gold was a gift typically only ever given to a king. Nobody else had it or could afford it. And we know that that gold and frankincense and myrrh helped with what we've already seen. And that is due to the response of Herod. So here's what happens. They worship him and they leave rejoicing, happy, and they are just ecstatic. And they go to sleep that night and they have a dream. And in the dream, the same angel of the Lord who told Mary and Joseph that Jesus would be born to them comes and says, hey, Herod's tricking you. He wants to kill this baby. You need to leave and don't tell him where the baby is. So they do. And when Herod figures out that he has been outwitted, that they are not going to tell him where this baby is. He is angry because you see this Herod has been a selfish, deceitful, conniving king who before this point in history already had killed three of his own sons. He had killed his own wife, his mother-in-law, and had hundreds of his officials put to death. And this is the same Herod who, when the day came that he would die, put it in his will that he wanted all of the noblemen in the region of Israel to be killed because he knew no one would cry for him and he wanted them to cry for somebody. He wanted there to be weeping in the land. So when he finds out there's a possibility of a king, he doesn't want anyone to take over for him. So what does he do? He does what every selfish person does. He seeks to destroy any competition and he sends soldiers to Bethlehem and every single boy baby who was born not just in the city of Bethlehem but in the entire region is put to death by soldiers. A few years ago I had a conversation with somebody and they said hey do you think can you just imagine how cool it would be if you were born in Bethlehem at the same time as Jesus and you could say I was born in Bethlehem at the same time as Jesus and I said actually in this text it shows us that nobody has that honor and all of the women who had babies in that region lost their baby boys and we may say that doesn't make any sense why how could that happen I can't tell you why other than the conniving wicked evil Herod was selfish and hated everyone but himself the good news is just like Moses was rescued Jesus was rescued and he was safe because God protected him. And so Herod did not win. He was not able to accomplish what he hoped to accomplish. So what do we have going on in this story? Well, there's a lot of different actors and I'm gonna walk you through who they are and then we're gonna see if you can find yourself in this story. The first set of people are our magicians or our wizards. And we don't know how many there were. We like to sing the song, Three Wise Men, and we do that because there were three gifts, but we don't know how many there were. These men were Gentiles. They were sinners. They were magicians. They actually did things that maybe even in the Hebrew scriptures were not right. They would maybe be a little bit like astrologers today, but they believed that they could see in the stars what would happen and what had happened. And so they probably were familiar with the promises because when the people of Israel were taken into captivity in Babylon, men like Daniel would have brought scripture with them. And he may even have taught some of these men's forebears, their ancestors. This is what will come. And so they had this history that they were looking for. And they were not the most likely to worship the one true God. But here they are looking for the promised king. And because of their persistence, they find him and they worship at his feet, even as a baby. The next group of people that we see are these priests and scribes. And these are the religious leaders of their day. They're extremely knowledgeable. The, what we call the Old Testament, many of them would have memorized most of it, definitely the first five books. And they knew all kinds of things. They could play Bible trivia all day long 
and wear you out. Who's the oldest man in the Bible? Well, that's easy, that's Methuselah. How many people went on the ark? Eight. Uh, let's go with a harder question. Uh, how many rules are in the Old Testament instruction? Oh, 365. Can you tell me which king came after which king? Oh, definitely. We have, and they would just run you through. And you go, how do you do this? This is where they lived. So when Herod brings them in and says, hey, there's a promise that a king will be born. Uh, can you tell me where? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's easy. Bethlehem of Judea. And here's the thing that strikes me as I read this text and should strike you too. The magicians went looking for Jesus. They went looking for the promised king. These scribes and Pharisees and priests lived less than five miles away from where this happened. And they never once are, are described as looking for where this king was born. So many of us are like that. We have a lot of knowledge and information, but it doesn't change anything in our lives. Then we have King Herod. He was an evil man. He was fearful and vengeful and murderous. And not only did he kill all of his opponents and his family members, but he kills a bunch of babies who did nothing wrong, all because he's afraid of this one child who would be the king of the Jews. Because that's who these magicians, these magi came looking for. They said, where is the king of the Jews going to be born? Where has he been born? And then... Last, and most importantly, we have King Jesus, a baby, born to the most unlikely woman, hidden, unknown, not born in a palace, and yet a star showed the way to where he was laying, to where he was living. And when these wise men saw the star, they understood what it meant, and they went looking for the promised king. If we step back and look at this event as a whole, there's a lot of scandal involved in it. There's a teen mom, a baby conceived out of wedlock. Shepherds, which we read about in different accounts, were not well looked upon by anybody because they lived out in the fields, they were dirty and smelly and nobody trusted them. And then here we have these magi who are Gentile sinners. All of the people directly involved in the story of Jesus coming to earth did not fit the narrative that anybody expected the coming Messiah to fit. He is not who they were looking for. And this picture is a picture of what the ministry of this king would look like. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And he spent his time with the most unlikely of people, with adulterers and prostitutes and tax collectors and despised Roman soldiers and lepers. And he picked common men to be his followers and key leaders. And he came to deliver them from their sin. And he came to deliver me from my sin. And he came to deliver you from your sin. So when we look at these different groups, we might see ourselves in one of them. We have three different categories today. The first one is indifference. Maybe this is you. You're like the priests and the scribes. You know all kinds of things and you do nothing with it. Maybe you have hundreds of Bible verses memorized, but you don't live out what they say. Is that you? Could you win a Bible trivia game, but your life does not reflect the kind of instruction that Jesus gives us to follow every day? You don't live like Jesus did or live like Jesus instructed us to. It hasn't changed your heart or your behavior in any way. You're indifferent. You just don't care. You're apathetic. If that's you, then you need to come to the Savior and acknowledge that knowledge is not enough. You need to tell him that you want to obey what he says and live life the way he calls you to because you could be in church and this could be your story. You're not being obedient to the gospel if that's the case for you. That's the first group. Lots of knowledge, no application. The next group is just flat out hostile. This is King Herod. He sees Jesus as a threat and says, I don't want anything to do with him, and I want him dead if I can have that happen. 
Maybe you can identify with Herod. Maybe there's only one person in this room that you are most interested in helping, and that's yourself. Everybody else is your enemy, and if they don't advance your cause, you don't want anything to do with them. If they don't do what you want them to do, you don't want anything to do with them. If they won't give in to your demands, you have no use for them. When King Herod found out that Jesus was coming on the scene, it troubled him so much. And it also troubled everybody around him. Because people who are hostile make everybody around them nervous. And the text says that Herod was troubled and so was everyone else. Because they knew when he was mad, they could suffer the consequences for that. Do you live that way? Are there people in your life when you're troubled, they're troubled? Because you're trouble, they're in trouble? You walk in the room and people are like, don't look at me. Maybe you're hostile to people and you're hostile to God. There's a warning very clear in scripture from Jesus directly to you. And this is what Jesus says just a few chapters later in Matthew chapter 10. He says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. If you are not for Jesus, you are against him. And if you are against him, he is against you. And that may be a hard word to hear during the Christmas season when we celebrate this beautiful baby who came to rescue us from our sin. But that beautiful baby grew up into a savior who gave his life on a cross for our sin. And if you reject him, he has no room for you. There is only one response that we should each have toward Jesus, and that is worship. These magi, these Gentile sinners who had no clear understanding of who God was and what he expected from them, they knew what to do when they encountered Jesus. They worshiped him. They bowed themselves down and they gave gifts because this king was like no other. In Matthew 2, this is the first time we see Jesus called the king of the Jews, but it's not the last time we see him called the king of the Jews. You see, in the end of Matthew, when they brought Jesus to the hill on Golgotha and they put him up on a cross, one of the instructions from the governor, Governor Pilate, was that over him was to be put a sign in Aramaic, in Greek, and in Latin so that every person who walked by could read it. And the sign said this. It said, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. And if you read through Matthew, you know the very first time that was said was back at the very beginning in chapter 2 when the Magi came and they said, where is the King of the Jews? The answer comes in Matthew 27 at the end. And what happens to him? He is lifted up on the cross and he dies. And that is not what anybody expected when Jesus came. But Jesus knew that that was his path. And he told his disciples all through his ministry, I must die. I go to my death. And in order for you to live, I must die. And what else can we do for the one who has died to set us free than to worship him, to bow down at his feet, acknowledge that he is the king, and worship him. You see, they intended that sign to be scornful, but their scorn was truth. And he was the king. And he is worthy of our worship. So which one of, of these three are you today? Are you indifferent? Are you hostile or are you a worshiper? If you are indifferent, then you need to check your heart. And if you do not believe Jesus is the Savior, you need to come to him and ask him to forgive you of your sin and acknowledge him as Savior. If you believe he's the Savior, but you don't live that out in your life, then you need to start being obedient and start not just being a hearer of, of what he says, but doing what he says. It's not enough to hear. You have to do. Otherwise, you're not obedient. Are you hostile? Are you out for everybody, against everybody, and only for yourself? That path will lead you to death because that was what happened to Herod. And unlike the rescue that comes through Jesus, his end was not good. When you encounter Jesus, you ought to take the third path, which is to be a worshiper. Be like those Gentiles. Be like every other person who saw who Jesus was and worshiped him. 
and gave their life to him and said, I will do what you want me to do with my life. You are my Lord and my God and my Savior, and I will obey you to the end of my days. Worship him, and you will spend your eternity with him.